Hello, and thanks for listening to this episode of Time with a Creative Mind. We're meeting today with Dave Bartholomew, Distinguished Professor of English at the University of Pittsburgh. Professor Bartholomew served as chair of the department for 12 years, as head of the writing program for more than a decade, and is a recognized scholar across the fields of composition and the teaching of literature. We're fortunate to have Professor Bartholomew with us today. He's a guest of Rutgers University as a part of our Distinguished Alumni Lecture Series. And we want to take advantage of this opportunity to discuss with him the future of the profession, the future of book publishing, and his reflection on his remarkable career. Thanks for listening. So we uh, started this project, Time with a Creative Mind, uh, because there's a ton of work out there to help beginning writers. But there's actually, there's not much useful material out there to help experienced writers. <laughs> um, and as you know as a chair, um, uh, plenty of people manage to drag that first book across the finish line, and then that's it, yeah. right? And, and the first book is produced institutionally, right? I mean, right. it's produced by the dissertation, then it's produced right. by the right. tenure process. Um, so. I became interested in this project while I was chair and thinking about um, the the bloated associate prof professoriate. Um, but then, you know, as I become more interested uh, more broadly in the future of public intellectual life, um, I'm I'm really interested in um, people who've successfully invented their own careers, if you will. And, and my own sense is that that kind of invention isn't going to be optional in the future. It's actually going to be mandatory um, because of mm -hmm. how things are changing with publishing. Yeah. It would be nice to think so. I mean, I, the other view of the future is that it will be impossible. That's certainly the way it appears to me. In my institutional, my current institutional life, it seems impossible for people to have the kind of career that I once had. Well, and that's actually where I wanted to start the interview because your your career is so amazing because of your your being trained in this this department here in a highly uh, literary department, and then inventing a career for yourself in composition as the profession really invented itself at mm -hmm. that moment. Right. And, and then you've navigated this world that is a monograph driven um, without a monograph. Without a monograph. Right. And so, so I'm really struck by that. Uh, and I just read the interview you did with Shil, which I thought was fantastic, yeah, actually, on the, on the 25th anniversary right. of inventing the university so I'm reading inventing the university and I'm thinking we're going to be talking about inventing a career and so I wonder if you could I mean you I, I don't want you to go over the ground you covered in the interview with with John because um, that that's specifically focused on that groundbreaking essay right um, mm -hmm. I'm I'm more interested in in the way you conceived of yourself as a writer throughout this whole process, when the whole system is saying, the writer is the guy with books on the bookcase. And yet, because you're not a monograph-driven thinker, I don't think, yeah. um, so how do you put those that reality together? Is it a total aberration, or, or did you have a way of thinking about writing that helped keep you writing over your career when the goal wasn't the 300 page single bound right, volume. Right. Ask me the question again in a few minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh -huh. Because there are a number of ways of answering. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, one is I just don't think I have a 350 page brain. I don't think, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it isn't how I think of the things that I want to do. Even now, I'm at a point where I'm thinking about the next book, but I'm thinking about it. Uh, in some ways, like your last book, mm -hmm. I and mean, I'm thinking of it as a set of pieces that are certainly related and speak back and forth, but I'm writing them individually. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
so it's it's partly just the way it, sort of how, how my intellectual academic life intellectual life works i mean it was also a function of um sort of the re the, the reality of my career at its particular moment where you know i was a figure that people who, who people wanted to hear from early on at a time when there weren't, there was suddenly money to have speakers come to campus, for instance, or to have special conferences. And so I spent a ton of time preparing talks. And what do you do with talks? So it's also, the, and I was just fortunate. I mean, I think that it has been for me, one of the most discouraging things for me in a, my role as a past department chair was watching people who had reason to believe that they could have careers like mine stymied because they haven't been. They are part of, you know, they're in their 60s, they're associate professors, they've had very significant careers, but they don't have monographs, yeah. and the door slammed shut. And, you know, it is for me tragic, partly because of the individuals who, that I think of, but also because I think that, I mean, I, I really believe that the point that the MLA made that, you know, as we're imagining the terms and conditions of scholarship and how it's going to circulate, particularly given the new media opportunities and the economic realities of the uh, facing university presses, uh, I just think the mon I just don't think that I mean the the language of the MLA report was you can't make a fetish out of the monograph. You have to imagine alternate ways of scholarly publishing, alternate ways of being engaged with uh, a field and a topic. And I, I, it's such a power. I mean, I I believe so deeply in that argument. Plus, just historically, it's the right moment for that argument. Mm -hmm. And yet I'm on a campus where a dean who, in many ways, I, I admire, says, you know, one monograph for tenure, two monographs for promotion to full. I mean, I, when I, I mean, I'm, I now hold an endowed chair. I don't have a monograph. Right. I mean, I think I've had an influential career, but it just hasn't gone in that way. So, so I think I was very, very fortunate that I was, um, uh, you know, I, I was in a field that people that was evolving when people outside the field who needed to think about me as somebody whom they'd have as a colleague for <laughs> 20 years, uh -huh. they uh -huh. thought, well, well yeah, it seems it looks pretty interesting. And it just wasn't, it was never an issue. It was mm -hmm. never, I never felt that I needed to sit down to write the book. I just felt like there was work. I mean, I felt in, internally that there was work that I wanted to do and I would do it as I had the time and the occasion, and it produced a lot of essays. That's what it did. And, and I knew, actually, that the one, um, the one moment at which I strategically thought through a decision about how I would do my work was in relation to the textbook. I always wanted to write a textbook. Mm -hmm. I always wanted, I thought it was an interesting, as you know, it's an interesting writing problem, and it's a way of organizing the work of thousands of people who are going to be using the book, uh, but I knew that that was not something to do until I had tenure. I knew that that would be a bad decision. Uh -huh. That would have seen, that would have seemed trivial. Um, so that, I did wait on that, but everything else, I just, I, I, you know, it's how I was able to do the work at the time. It seemed like, and, and I was doing administration, and as you know, that put some of And when you teach, you know, and you're teaching in a field where you know, the, in, there's a way in which th there's not a continuity of subject. It's not like I'm working through the same set of Renaissance texts year in and year out, and therefore developing a huge sort of scaffolded argument. I wasn't doing. I mean, the big argument I had had to do with how you imagine under student writing, and um, so I think I was lucky. I think I was. I was fortunate, I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, I did a kind of work that caught people's attention so that uh, I did have the advantage of when I came up for tenure, when I was considered for promotion, of 
of, of having a reputation. There was a body of work that people knew and they admired and they were willing to speak for. And the question of the book just never came up. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's fascinating how contingent all of that is, right? Mm -hmm. But there's also, uh, you use this phrase, uh, you don't have a 350-page book brain. mind, brain, right. which I completely understand. It's such a funny constraint for uh, productivity that mm -hmm. it has to be measured in that kind of allotment. Um, as opposed to influence. I mean, influence, the case is open and shut. Uh, and, and yet, we're in a structure that I think is really ba bound by quantity uh, yeah. and feels very uncomfortable making assessments about quality. Yeah. So that's a negative statement. I don't have a 350-page uh, uh, brain. Um, but you obviously have a very fertile and productive writer's mind that takes the uh, forms as uh, quintessential essays. I mean, you've written a number of essays that are pivotal to the field, and you've also looked at producing a textbook as an, an intellectual project, and um, I don't, I really don't think that's common. I don't think that second step is common. I think uh, everybody wants to be the next Maryland hacker, but that's because they want to, <laughs> you know, they want to be carted around in a limousine everywhere, right? right I mean, they right. want to be able to go to the Yankees games, right? right? So, um, uh, so I, and then you know, connected the third thing connected to that is is an approach to the profession itself as a writer. That is, you've devoted considerable time to writing, I think, very important administrative documents that have come out of the MLA, that have talked about issues about uh, the work of contingent labor and so forth. So can we, can we move the sentence into a positive form? You know, it's not X kind of brain, and the institution in the, in the book-bound discipline says, if you don't have that kind of brain, you don't right. have any brain at all. Right. Right. But what's been so wonderful about being able to talk to people in this venue is to find the ways in which key players in helping people to think new thoughts um, have found ways to invent inside those yeah, constraints. Yeah, yeah. But I don't, I, I mean, I have an answer that feels too simple, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, you, you're, you're, you either find or are given or are confronted by a, problem, something that you want to write about, and you just do it. And, you know, you, it, there's a sense in which, you know, you're doing a report for the MLA. I mean, I, mean, I suppose there's an example. I mean, you know, I, I, I did chair this task force on um, uh, the use of non-tenure track labor, and it was a very important project for me because as you know from your administrative position, I spent years and years and years working with people whom I admired and whose careers I admired, who were invisible to my colleagues, who were unknown uh, in the department, and whose work I thought we needed to begin to understand as part of how English is organized, and has been. I mean, there was the sense that, that all of a sudden something happened in the 70s when the universities became highly bureaucratized and it was the corporate university and that produced non-tenure track labor but you know English from its opening moment mm -hmm. had professorial faculty and non-professorial faculty we think of them as graders um, so I wanted to do that and so you know you do a report and you do a report within the constraints of the genre but I knew that nobody was ever going to read it or I knew that some people would read it but it wouldn't mm -hmm. circulate widely and so I was very determined to do an essay from it and then did the essay in pedagogy that was important to me I mean I because I felt that there was something that I wanted to say I did what I needed to do in relation to the people who I thought would could make use of it and as I say early on I mean I, I was doing so many talks and I knew that there were things that I was saying that would be of interest to people and so 
I turn the talk into an essay. The one, but I, I will, uh, if I step to the other side, the one thing that I'll say that, and I actually think of it as part of, for me, a Rutgers legacy, is that I also knew that I wanted to do a kind of writing that in many ways was outside of a mold of scholarly writing. I wanted, I wasn't interested in footnotes and citations. I wasn't interested in organizing my work in relation to an ongoing argument that had multiple speakers. Uh, I wasn't interested in addressing a small audience. I wanted to address a big audience. Mm -hmm. And that, and, and as I think of where I am right now, I mean, I really want, if, I, if I'm writing another book, I want to write a book, in, in many ways, like your book. I mean, I want to write a book that um, imagines the broadest possible readership, where I think humbly I will explain composition to the United States of America. Why are we investing all this time and energy? Whether I'll do it or not, I don't know. I mean, mm. I've written a couple of chapters worth and I have a sense of, I know exactly what I want to do. And then the other thing, and I was thinking this also, and I, so now I'm, just, I'm telling the story of when I sit down to write something, what's on my mind. Um, the other thing that, that's on, the other thing that I find myself doing more and more is wanting to, because I, I want to foreground student writing uh, because I think it's really a very interesting genre, unread, people don't know how to read it. I find that, that as I think about this book, it will be a book, if I do this book, <laughs> that will feature five courses that I've taught. Mm. And what I want to do is essentially have an excuse for stringing together sections of student papers that I think are really interesting to read and interesting to read in this order, in relation to each other. And then I provide the context of thinking about whatever argument I'm making about student writing and how, in this, how this particular course is organized and what it does. There's a kind of anthologist, journalistic impulse to provide a place for this for other people's writing that would otherwise be lost to be made present. And it is an odd, I mean, uh, it's an odd moment to be in. And I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm no Walter Benjamin, but it's sort of <laughs> Benjamin of the Arcades Project, I mean, where, where the, the, the use of the quoted material becomes more important than, you know, the sort of authorial position and the argument being spun out. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I, but one of the things, from the very beginning, one of the things that, that I wanted to do was, and one of the things that I like, one of, as I think back on my career, one of the things that I take pleasure in is the way in which just about everything that I wrote was at some point in time a way of a sort of uh, recognizing, presenting, valuing the work of student writers because I that to me that's what composition is Com to be in composition you have to know how to engage manage and value this work if not it's you know it's a sort of constant ironic moment where you know you preside over the failure of thousands of students yeah. and then you document what how far <laughs> how far have they fallen how yeah. what is this great distance and I don't that was never the way I wanted to work the book you outline, I'm also hearing of writing process that imagines intellectual work in relation to narrative itself. That is, that, yeah. that you're telling a story, yes. at which Bill Coles obviously had a way of telling the story of composition. Right. Right. Um, but your way of telling the story is a very different one. Yeah. I, th I see it in it. It's genealogically related, but. Oh, yeah. no, this book is a, a revision of or an homage to. Uh, the plural I, which right. I don't, I wouldn't want to do that kind of book, but I would like to do a book that somehow makes a writing class present, so that you can have a, somebody who's not there, or who's there but doesn't want to be there, wants to be <laughs> someplace else. Says, "Oh, well, I see what's going." Yeah, on. Right. Um, and I'm also hearing the sequencing of assignments. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a certain way that I, yeah. the, so it's it's related to the intellectual contribution of. 
uh, ways of reading, there are a number of them, but one is the idea that one is engaging in a set of writing activities that are related over right. a period of time. Right. Right. And that, that that's a way to make the writing the center of the course as opposed to the teacher's magisterial comments or yeah. the sudden ringer who shows up and right. writes papers that they would have written right. anyway, right? right. right. <laughs> Um, yeah. I, there's a phrase I want to make sure I ask you before we run out of time, because in the interview with Shield, you used this phrase that, you know, I know I feel like I know your work pretty well, <laughs> um, but you use this phrase that, that caught me off guard, actually, and, and I was really <clears throat> struck by it. You say that you think of inventing the university as an exercise in felt theory. Well, I can tell you what it meant to me. Yeah. What, it, what it meant to me was, you know, I mean, it, it, it was of the moment when uh, people were reading uh, French theorists, and I was reading them as well. And, you know, there was a kind of essay that, that actually John Schill wrote and others wrote uh, who had, that had a title something like Foucault for the Teacher of Composition, and it would be a long explanation of... Foucault, and then there would be uh, an obligatory final section that was about the turn to the classroom. Right. Uh, and we have books like this, right? I sure. Mean, we, um, and we, and there, and in many ways, there book, we have books in our series that are like this, and, I, and books that I admire. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to to sort of acknowledge that this was a very powerful way of thinking about writing, uh, and just establish it as a frame, and then think that way. In other words, I wanted to use it as a way of talking about the classroom and reading student papers without it being the occasion for me and Foucault to pretend like we were, you know, colleagues right, or right, buddies right. or here I am. Um, so that's that's what it meant to me. It, it meant that, you know, there's a very powerful change in the way that you think about writing when you, you know, I mean, at, at the simplest level, when suddenly you think that the author is dead and that, you know, and that writing doesn't belong to anybody and you think, Jesus Christ, now what am I doing? Right, <laughs> right. You know, and, and is there any way in which, because I feel the power of that, do I just set it aside and then go teach a writing class or do I feel the power of it? And then, I mean, I'm not going to go into the class to explain Foucault, but I do want to go into the class to give kids some feeling about where they stand in relationship to you know, prior texts and the articulations of power within which they are inserted, and so on, so on, and so right. forth. But and so you try to find a classroom language. So that's that's what the phrase. That's what it meant to me. It just it was just I thought. I mean, I had many times lamented the structure of the book and the article that explained Foucault for somebody who presumably couldn't read Foucault on their own. And I took that as that was an ironic gesture that I didn't endorse and I didn't like. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, they're teachers. They're not going to be able to get it. And then, you know, the obligatory, and then here, here's the application of the classroom, which, you know, it's not a class structured around. It's thinking down on the class from that. I knew that I just, I knew I didn't want to do it. And I, so I had, that was an argument I had been making, but when I read the line in Ben's book, I just thought, yeah, I like that line. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, I actually had, was reading the book and John talked to me about doing the interview. <laughs> and I mean, I also, I mean, there's a certain agenda there and that I like promoting the notion that one way to be a professionally, intellectually engaged in, a, in a, something like composition is to read outside the field and to think it speaks to you. So right. I, there is that element as well. I, that's a great <laughs> answer. And, and there are a couple of things I want to follow up on. The first one is, it, it's it's so interesting to me that you said you want the students to feel the force of yeah. these things, yeah. right? Which is the. Mm -hmm. uh, the other model is to say, I want them to understand it, right. or I want them to be able to uh, summarize it accurately. Right. Um, and so I, I just see a connection between a, a commitment in, in the essayistic mind um, as, as you inhabit it, 
and a goal of producing writing that works both at the level of argument but also at the level of feeling. Yeah. You know this, obviously, but inventing the university, people have such a visceral reaction to it. I mean, I think one of the reasons why it's alive for 25 years is that people people really feel right. viscerally responsive to it, but not because you're being polemical. Uh, there's something about the way you stage the story of the classroom and and that the university that you invent is not one where you receive Foucault's wisdom and then pass it on to everybody no, else, right. but that the university that, as you imagine it, is a place where students invent their own futures and right. their own relationships to right. um, writers. Right. Um, so I, I think that emphasis on feeling as it articulates itself through pedagogy is extraordinary. See, yeah. I, wouldn't put the, I wouldn't put the emphasis on feeling, though. I would put the emphasis on, I mean, feeling as it relates to practice, feeling your way through. The burden for me for a class, I mean, for instance, it seems to me that if I'm doing a class that's inspired, that's Foucauldian, I don't... It doesn't have readings in it. it. It it's a class that I teach every semester mm -hmm. that I find myself having to teach every semester, including, with certain exceptions, to graduate students. And that is, you know, a kid, a student gives you a paper that has a long block quotation, and the block quotation is there like a monument. It is there or it's there like a fortress. It's to make me invulnerable, because yeah. I've now got... And when a student has to revise that, and for me, that I usually say to students, you know, you, you, you know, it's not just a matter of putting it there, it's a matter of doing something with it, which means the space that comes before and the space that comes after is primary. And I say, and I think you'd be very wise to pick up a phrase or a key term, something so that when you're going on, the person who's reading you can see how you're reading the, and that moment of trying to figure the revision out, even if you're just phrasing it in, okay, now you have to speak to. Or, I mean, I'm, te I'm teaching right now in uh, both a junior seminar and a freshman comp seminar. And I have the same problem in both. I mean, I, I've had them working, I had them working with a book of poems, a uh, mm. book I like to teach by Tony Hoagland, with a wonderful title, What Narcissism Means to Me. <laughs> I love it. It's a great book. <laughs> uh, and, and then I gave them a, a really quite interesting essay by a poet critic, Craig Arnold, who's talking about Hoagland and two other poets in relation to a new kind of performative poetry that's not, he's, he, he calls confessional poetry autopoetic, people speaking to themselves or to a small group, mm -hmm. uh, autopoeticism. Uh, I like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and then, and, and so then I said, and then and now I want you to bring Arnold into the discussion, but I want you to stage it out in such a way that Arnold, will, you know, you've got a confrontation with the book. Arnold allows, he brings, some terms to you, like persona, mass caricature, that allows you to move in a certain way, and then you're, you're on the stage again at the end. Every, I mean, and those instructions were very clear. Every student in the junior seminar and the freshman seminar start with Arnold and end with Arnold, and in the middle they talk about a couple of poems. Right. And, you know, so what is it that makes that so hard? Well, I think that's what Foucault's writing about. I mean, I think what makes it so hard is imagining that there is a space to speak that even though you're you know it's all being said all around you and there's and, and you're not you, you you don't participate you're not given the status and authority that Craig Arnold has in the Yale Review however you figure out how to so felt for me is felt through the difficulty of making what seems like a simple revision after the block quote, before the block quotation, set it up. After the block quotation, it's your turn to speak. That's really hard. Uh, and yet, once it gets started, it, there's a trajectory that informs a whole course. And, 
and I think it's theor it's a powerful theoretical trajectory. But you don't, you know, I, to teach a writing class, I don't need to theorize it. I just need to ask people to do it, and then to encourage them as they do it. One of the difficulties with the way in which the very best courses were imagined is that they didn't imagine revision as part of the course. It really, it imagined the relationship at which the teacher observed in the students this very interesting problem, but then the course just kept reproducing that moment, and it never said to the students, now, next week, you're not starting a new paper, you're going to go back and work on it, and, and, it's not, and this is not a m trivial task, this is, you're really, this is more work, this is a, a major next step, even if it's just, it's got to be twice as long, uh, mm -hmm. or it's got to be, you know, I don't, there can be no two pages that, that, you know, I can look at and see that they're, par you know, the pa they're paragraphed the same right. way. Uh, then suddenly, you know, students are feeling themselves inside a, a, a problematic, we would say, that, that uh, would inform the possibilities of revision, and then you just keep that going, so. So that's what felt. Yeah, I, 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 it's it's a useful. And let, uh, and let me. And, yeah, go so ahead. I'll say because this was the when I said at the very beginning, ask me the question again. And unfortunately, I'm not going to make his name come into my head. But th I think there's a, and it was it came it was in response to the, this was written in response to the MLA report. Okay. And it's the it's the it's the man who's at NYU who's written so well in ADE about. Oh, John Gillery. John Gillery, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, one of the points that he makes is that, you know, we all, there, all of us of our generation know incredibly brilliant teachers who didn't publish at all, and yet they were deeply engaged in a scholarly way with their fields, and their public, where they made their work public was in the classroom, and, and I think that's true. I mean, I actually believe that to be true. Well, it's, it's memorialized in your choice for the name of the endowed chair, right? It I mean, is, I, right? that is exactly right. right. That is, that's exactly right. I own the Charles Crow chair, and Charles Crow taught freshman English to James McIntosh, who was, a, did, was not an English major, did a law degree, went to become a, a you know, high-ranked official uh, for H.J. Hines, a Pittsburgh company, <laughs> never always remembered uh, the freshman class he took with Crow and gave the money in honor of Charles Crow for the work he did in the freshman class. And Crow, in his lifetime, did not publish. Um, and it was said, actually, he was put up by the department for um, a distinguished service professorship. And the phrase that Guillory uses is a phrase that actually is in this letter that was written, what, 25 or 30 years earlier, saying, you know, he, he took his scholarship to the classroom and he published it for his students. And that, that was the case they made for him. And, and, I, do, and I think that is a way. I mean, we, we know of our colleagues for whom that's true. Yes. And, yes. Uh, and yet it is not. We, do, we don't. It, it's impossible to reward them, and that's a shame, I think. What you've just described, uh, it's a very useful uh, clarification of my uh, abbreviated statement about feeling, that, that you really, you're, you structure your classes so that uh, your students experience what it means to be part of an intellectual community. Um, yeah, I tried to. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think your essayistic form strives to do the same thing. As I read your work, it's designed to generate experiences for the reader. And as the profession has become more professionalized, the essay has become harder and harder for the profession to read. Mm -hmm. That they approach something that's 20 pages long as an article. And I think an article and an essay are not the same thing. Right. So we started by saying, looking ahead, uh, you see a dark prospects for inventing your own future um, for scholars now. And there's obvious reasons for concern, the publishing, the histories we know at our own institutions, and more broadly about the 
people who have done good work and you know, the kind of teachers you've described and who are um, stalled uh, professionally at certain levels because the institution itself can't recognize that kind of ability to construct experiential labor as consequential. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you see as the future for the kind of publishing that you've done? Is it, does it continue, but it continues uh, now in the 21st century without an ability to become legible for the institution? That's a good question. But I'm trying not to be too glum. Well, <laughs> glum's fine. I mean, if glum's the way it is, so it's this, the way this, it is. This is actually, is I, this is, I had to finally cut this from the talk I'm going to give this afternoon. Okay, so it would end happily. But, uh, <laughs> so, so Cambridge, Eng so you think of English formed by, sort of with Aya Richards as a starting point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm that was not about the institutions of literature, but it was about linguistics yeah. and about how to, how to teach language, how to teach adults to understand their own language without this, the kind of specificity of, of what was then linguistics and philology. And it produced this remarkable group of people. William Empson, uh, I mean, I mean, Richards gets this started, and what's the next thing that he does? Does he become a leading literary critic? No, he goes to China. He goes to China, right, and, right. and to, to, to try to teach basic English. Yeah. So he's got, he's not confined by or constrained by a set of institutional expectations. And then you can sort of chart this group out, and it includes a number of interesting people who were actually very important to Rutgers and Rutgers English. That yes, is, yes. Ruben Brower studied with Richards, Poirier studied with F.R. Levis, uh, Frank Kermode is a major figure there, Raymond Williams is a major figure, and my colleague Colin McCabe is an interesting figure. And now that piece I did not know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, well, okay. Colin, I mean, Colin's moment was uh, essentially being denied tenure by the Levisites at Cambridge. I remember that. Uh, yeah because he was interested, they said he was interested in French theory, but he was really interested, and he wrote a book on Joyce called James Joyce and the Revolution of the Word, and as his career took shape, he was interested in the revolution of the word, not in James Joyce, and he became interested in film and a mm -hmm. variety of the ways mm -hmm. in which, let's say, narrative circulates in the world and very powerfully. So he then goes off to Strathclyde to organize a new program of literary linguistics. But at the end of his career, Raymond Williams gives three talks. Um, one is a, his retirement talk. One is inspired by the McCabe case. And, and I, I don't know the inspiration for the third, but they're all reflecting back on Cambridge English and what it makes possible. And, and of course, if you think of Williams in this trajectory, it's the mm -hmm. Williams of key words and the right. Williams of the long revolution who's really interested in language and use and how do we understand, instruct, um, intervene in the, the trajectory of language as it's used. And he's thinking through what happened with Cambridge English and he sees the, what he, Levis is the bad guy for many as they think back now and they see Levis's turn to the great tradition that is turning to prior forms of language use as a way to recuperate or to stop what's seen as a degradation as being the, you know, that, that was the end of the, the sort of fruitful period of Cambridge English. And so for people who shared his interest in how do we think about a very difficult conjunction of all the Englishes that are at play in England in, this is the 1980s. Uh, where will this work take place? He says, it will take place in the voluntary underground, mm. which is a very resonant phrase in the history of the American university. And as I think now of the people who, who haven't had the fortune that I've had to keep moving forward. I mean, I, you know, in another university at another point in time, I wouldn't have been tenured, 
I wouldn't have been promoted to full professor, and nobody would have considered giving me an endowed chair. Right. They wouldn't have. Yeah. I would be part of the voluntary underground. Yeah. And I mean, there's a line of argument that says, given the crisis of academic publishing, that is, the, a crisis in how it gets its funding through universities, a crisis in we can't get anybody anymore to, to serve as, as reviewers for our manuscripts, peer review, people don't buy the books, they don't read the books. So given, given this, and given at the same time, open access, the ease of publication and transmission via the internet, this, this is what will determine the new shape of scholarship. And the, there was a study called the Ithaca study that interviewed a lot of people, and, and it said basically that at the highest level, university administrators don't know about and don't really have a sense of academic publishing. At the professorial level, everybody wants to maintain an old f hierarchical form yeah. where good work is seldom read. Good work only goes into the most prestigious, to the most prestigious channels of publication. It's monograph form, and that you know, the, it, it, history is going to erase that. What's yeah. going to happen is media commons, open access. I mean, suddenly. That's how knowledge is going to be transmitted, and it will have its own preferred generic forms. And and however I conceive of the essay, it's not going to be there. I mean, it's <laughs> it's going to be it's going to have pictures and sound, and it's going to be very different. Well, thank you. That thank was, you. This was great. Was I didn't know this was what we were going to talk about. I actually enjoyed this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of Time with the Creative Mind. I hope you'll check out the other podcasts in our series and that you'll drop us a line.